Flora consonata, the same fly that attacks gypsy moth and giant silk moths. Yeah. So we have a house in Wellfleet on the Cape. We back up to forest, and it got totally decimated um, this, this spring and early summer. With and gypsy moths? With yeah. gypsy moths, yeah. Everything was completely defoliated. Right. And then we have a house in Newton, and there was nothing. And so, was there that much difference in rainfall? Uh, what would make the difference between the two places? Good question. Uh, maybe. I don't know. I, you know, these populations build over time. So it's not just this year's rainfall, but last year's rainfall. I expect it's a different rainfall. You know, I don't know. Yes, yeah, the back. What's the effect of pesticides on your sea albicans fly? Is it killed by? It would kill them. So uh, you know we. We hope that you will avoid spraying for, I would avoid spraying for winter moth <coughs> this year anyway. Winter moth densities declined last year on their own due to the, 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 the frost that happened on the first week of April. That took the winter moth back. So I think the winter moth densities are low anyway. And the fly is taking hold here in Newton, so we'll see. I would, I would hold off. Yes? I heard there's a way of, um Killing the gypsy moth by putting tape on your tree, they glue, and they, they they start crawling up in June and they get stuck. Yeah, well. The the gypsy moth blow in the wind, like the winter moth. Most of them they blow in the wind when they first hatch, and so they they're up in your tree already. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't I wouldn't bother. Yeah. You, you mentioned that the winter moth was also introduced into the Pacific Northwest. Yes. Did, did those folks also keep really good track of the progress of the fly? Did they introduce the fly? No. Oh, so we don't have, you know, they've had, you know, conservative governments in the Northwest, and then they've been decimated too. Uh, you know, the people that used to work out there are no longer employed. But it did, the fly was introduced and control happened. Yes. Okay. Uh, it, can, it happened to a certain degree. It, it, was, it was much more better control in Nova Scotia than out there for reasons that no one knows. Oh. So you saw the pattering on the leaves. I mean, the gypsy moth, winter moth is still out there, but, and we can still collect them by the thousands as we did, but they're not causing defoliation like they used to. Yes? You talked about the mouse um, correlation between mice eating. Yeah. Do, does anyone eat the winter moth? Like, do mice eat the winter moth or only the gypsy moth? Uh, well, the shrews are feeding on the on the pupae. I don't know. We don't think the shrews are. We're not sure. Okay, so I'm going to go one step. I have a big. Oh, there's one point to make. Oh. Well. Yeah, the mice the the the, 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 the pupae are a lot bigger for when they have much better food for a mouse. Okay. That's one thing, and uh, you know the the the, the winter moths are down in the ground where the, the mice probably have a hard time finding them. They're only little, they're little tiny things about the size of a, you know, a Cheerio or something. So in addition, I'm an advocate for native plants, so could you argue to put more oak trees so you have more acorns, so that you have more food for the mice, so that at least that they're in there? Well, <laughs> I mean, we have a lot of, you know, we have a lot of oak forests. I mean, I don't, it's, it's hard to imagine you doing that on a scale enough to make a difference. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this might be kind of a pretty naive question, but um, is there any coordination with some of the companies that are spraying pesticides. So if you have a neighbor who's spraying spinosad several times and, and that's killing the sea albicans, is there any, like, how would you, is there any recommendation you would make to communicating with them that this is probably killing the, the effort that's being made to kill, to, to control winter moths in a biological way? Or are well, you, um, is, are the pesticide companies aware I mean, of what's going on? Or no. Yeah, I, 
I haven't tried to do that. I did persuade the town of Wellesley to stop spraying the town trees. They only had a town program. And I don't know if you have a program here in Newton. No, no, I'd like to know no, that. Nobody, nobody. Because I, I hope the town would stop a town program. <laughs> right, right. I can't, you know, we can't prevail on individual homeowners. Sure, they, sure, they're going to spray their trees. Now. Eggs. Oh, okay, so there's those little town party things. They have about 600 eggs in them. Right, so there's no instars at all in the leaf litter at this point? No, no, just okay. eggs. Yes. So we're seeing these kind of spreads of these new insect pests, and of course now we have the longhorn beetles and the emerald ash borer. At some point, are we going to start seeing so many trees, so many species dying off that, that we're just going to see lots of death of trees and nothing is going to be able to recover? Well, I do worry particularly about the Asian longhorn beetle because its favorite tree is maples. Mm -hmm. ah. No, uh, they, you know. And, and of course, the animal ash borer, we're about to lose all our ash trees. That's moving across the landscape fast and it kills the trees very quickly. So it's a kind of a frightening scenario. And the hemlocks, I work on hemlock woolly adelgid, we're losing a lot of our hemlocks. So, you know, uh, we have this invasion going on worldwide because of all the, the human trade, and that's what's causing it. It's, I never thought I would see the damage to at least so many different species from so many different species. When I first moved here in Massachusetts, it was just gypsy moth. So it's I mean, there'll be trees left, but I don't know what. <laughs> Tulip trees, it sounds like. <laughs> Tulip trees, but... <laughs> yeah. Well, this raises a question about, you know, the future. There's other bugs in Asia that could come here. Is the government more serious now about packaging materials? Oh, uh, yes. Well, for sure. I mean, the Emerald Ash Borne and Asian Longhorn Beetle got here on solid wood packing all those, those pallets that are right. shipped here by the millions from China. So there are now regulations which require that the Chinese uh, um, either fumigate or um, um, heat, you know, what's, the, what's the word? The, the heat, you know, apply heat to the, uh, to the palace so they kill the insects. At least that's, that's what they're supposed to do, of course. Enforcing that rule on the nation of China is not such an easy thing to do for the, you know, for the Chinese government. So why not require plastic or metal or something? Good point. I know, I, yeah, that would, well, of course, that's much more expensive. It's not being well, yeah. Yeah. I think I read in one of the horticultural sites that they said that in the fall you can spray uh, all season spray oil by bonine and it's uh, an oil and you put it up uh, four or five feet up high and it kills and smothers the insects by smothering the eggs and it's environmentally friendly. What do you think about that? I don't have a good answer for that. I mean, of course the eggs are way up in the tree too. I mean. The females climb the trees and lay those eggs. And Apparently you can do it early. So and then they blow, the larvae blow in from surrounding trees. That's the other problem. So I mean, I know there's work where you kill all the larvae in a tree and then you go back and, you know, two weeks later or a week or so later, there's this and then the larvae there were. So it seems kind of unlikely, but I can't say that it doesn't work. I don't, I don't, I don't do pesticide research. Yes. Is there any natural predator for woolly adults? Huh. That's another topic. Well, <laughs> so I work on this system. I, I'm, in fact, I, last week I was in Seattle. I'm studying the hemlock woolly adelgid on, in Seattle, where it's on. I, I have an experiment going on um, in Washington Park Arboretum in mean, Seattle, where it's, uh, the, the adelgid is, is, is on eastern and western hemlock going side by side. Anyway, I'm, I'm in Seattle, the, the, the system, the adelgids are, are nowhere near as dense as they are here. And there's a particular beetle called Laracobius, a little black beetle that we're introducing here. It's been host study testing. It's so far it's not taken off very well, but it has established uh, in the Delaware Water Gap and down further south and in, in North Carolina, we have established this beetle in significant numbers. So it's very hopeful whether it'll fix the problem, it remains to be seen. And thus far we have not succeeded in doing so here in New England. Both the adelgid the adelgid is not very well adapted. It, it, it has high, we had almost 100% mortality. That big cold snap we had on Valentine's Day, it killed almost all the adelgids in New England. Uh, but the adelgid bounces back very quickly. When, when you kill the adelgid, you, you wipe out the food for the beetle. The, beetle, the larval beetle feed on the adelgid ovisac in March, the, the developing egg. So we have not successfully established the beetle here yet, but we're working on it. Do you think the drought made it difficult for the beetle? 
The drought certainly made it difficult for the hemlocks to survive. Hemlocks do not survive well in drought when they're infested with the don't do that well. They're, they're scale insects. There's a lot of, a lot of hemlock mortality. I've seen a lot of hemlock mortality. Even though the drought has been here for 20 years, it's just now killing our trees. It takes a long time for these trees to die. But it's a tragedy. It's a real tragedy. I hope we can fix it. How about the birds? Do they feed on the moss? On the moss. 815? Uh, well, that's a good question. We, we did some experiments which I didn't prevent, where we, we, we put out bird explosions to, to, to keep the birds off and compared the, the number of caterpillars. They would be feeding on the caterpillar stages. The birds love winter moss. They don't like gypsy moss so much because they're hairy and caterpillar. They love winter moss. But just like with the mice, when you have 100,000 caterpillars per tree, the birds can feed all day and not make a dent in the population. So that's what we show. There's, there's no detectable impact on the, in the dense population of winter moss on the avian predators. So I couldn't present that data, but I, I talked to my little one. Yes? Um, getting back to the banding, because that, that made me feel a little better, because every year I, I want to try the classic thing and I run out of time before they're flying. What, why is it that the banding doesn't work if, if you, I mean, I've seen the kind where you put like the, sort of fiberfill under the thing to yeah. try to get the crevices in the bark. Are they crawling up underneath it anyway, or is it just so many can come in from neighboring trees that aren't banded? Well, we, we do a lot of banding at the part of our winter moss sampling. It's amazing how, I mean, we'll put up one band, and then we'll put another band above it, another band above that, and mm -hmm. uh, you still get moss on the on the band above. They, they manage to crawl over dead moss or whatever. It's and the, the so, volume is so high. Uh, you know, so you might have an effect. I don't know. I don't, again, I don't, I don't do that. <coughs> it might work. But then again, they'll already blow in the wind in the spring, so uh, it might it probably won't work. But I, I, I just don't do that kind of research, so I don't, I can't advise you. Yeah. Uh, so how cold does it have to get for hemlock woolly algae to die off? Is it say? It's about minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Minus 20 Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. And just one cold spell though for it's yeah, one cold spell enough. We have a little machine in my lab that measures when when the algae freezes. Yeah. The temperature at which it freezes, and it's. So we have really great data on this, and they, they, they cold adapt. So we, we had a very warm winter last year, and then we had a icy blast on Valentine's Day, and it killed all the adults. Oh, so and the peach is true when it's rad. All the peach crop. Yeah, destroyed. yeah, right. So, uh, it, it, yeah, so, and so the adults last winter were not cold adapted. The right. previous winter, they had colder temperatures, so the same temperature didn't kill them. Oh, okay. So, it's a very interesting question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah, another question related to uh, gypsy moth and I guess tree more more vitality. Um, I, I do some forestry work and like you mentioned a, a court harvest, which is a lot of yeah. the landowners want to do right now, seeing a lot of you know defoliated oak trees. Yeah. Uh, I guess my question is, you know, would you really know looking at you know if the trees this fall, which ones are gonna you know actually die? You know, a lot of trees can come come back after defoliation? Yeah, for sure. Most trees will survive one defoliation. So it's when you get back to back defoliation. So you want to you wait get two, or, two or three years? Yeah, two or three years, and then, and then you start to lose a lot of trees. So that if you've had defoliation one year, I mean, I would, I would think about protecting them this year. And in terms of whether you can tell whether the tree is dead or alive now, I imagine a, a tree person probably could. I mean, we don't know. Would, would they, have they produced new buds? I know that, you know, that's, that's a, I have orchard trees, and, that's something you can see. Would you suggest fertilization? I'm sorry? Would you suggest fertilization of the trees? Yes, absolutely. And then you can your trees survive. Now, whether that would help it come back or not, again, I'm not really a tree person, but anything you do to help your trees, uh, you know, you know, it's something that's worth this doing. This summer, it was water. Yeah, yeah water. Yeah. I mean, water your trees. And it, you're not, you know, I was watering my trees you know, last, May, last May and June. How do you wait? Okay, so I, I've been spraying my trees for winter moth. Yeah. Um, but I, and I think like the condos across from me do, but I don't think a lot of other people do. What, what, I'm trying to figure out how to weigh the benefits of not spraying, how much of a difference does it make if not a lot of people are spraying anyway versus um, spraying to pr protect the tree? Yeah, well, I mean, you need to, you need to protect your tree. I don't, Object that people protect their trees. I protect my trees. If, if 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 that's how you're going to do it, I mean, I think that this year, 
because the density of the winter moth came down so hard yeah. last year. This is a year you can This get year off. maybe it's skip and also, you know, I think it's, I think this may take off. I think this is here in Newton. Mm. It just hasn't caused a lot of mortality yet. But hopefully in the next few years it will. How, how many years uh, between sort of showing up in Nova Scotia and Sort of getting the winter moth under control and the so it, it, my graph showed that they did the first release. They did first release in 1954. They had no recoveries until 1958, I think. That's recovering. Recovering the fly. The fly. Yeah. And so parasitism in 1959 was 10 percent. Next year it was about 40 percent, and then it went to 60 percent. And then Agropon came on too. And so by 1961, the winter moth collapsed and we couldn't build any other things. So that's what we hope to achieve. I think we have a good shot at it, but we'll see. I mean, maybe it'll be more like you know British Columbia, where it's winter moth is still abundant but not causing any damage. Well, we'll see. Yes, correct. Did they yes. introduce the wasp in the northwest as well? I uh, yeah, I mean, we're actually doing a bit. We're, we're, we're quite interested in it. You know, that's the wasp agroplant. In, no, in the Pacific Northwest, I mean, we, we do our collections. In, the fly is around 50 percent parasite, and the wasp is around 3 percent parasite. Oh. So it's not a big deal. However. We've started, we, we discovered, we think it's a species complex. We, we have wasps from Finland and wasps from, from Nova Scotia. We're doing a big DNA study, and there, there are different clades or different groups of wasps, and they're, they're different. Like many of these species, uh, they're, they're, there's only a handful of taxonomists in the world that can identify them. And, you know, you start out with one species and you end up with ten. That's, we have several species, like the black oak gall wasp, down in Cape Cod, is killing all these things. Now I'm named after my graduate student, Monica Davis, <laughs> because you know she did the DNA study to show that species it's unknown to science. We, you know, we have any number of species like this in my lab, uh, including some attacking winter moth, and the agroplant probably is going to turn out to be something like that. But we stayed away from it because it's a taxonomic mess. We're not releasing it because, it's, as far as we know, it's a generalist. Oh, if somebody wants to help with your, it's collecting the caterpillars, correct, Nick May? Yes. You collect caterpillars, and what, what does that involve? Like, what do you do with them when you... I think Gail, Gail is, Gail Bolt was here earlier. She helped to collect it, so several people on that. I had, well, send me an email. Okay, so that's and the kind so, of way I'd like to And then we, we gathered together on, at Wellesley College campus yeah. on the, the week of the 20th of May, and we'd send out crews. So last year we had 10 crews, 38 people total, and we collected caterpillars. We've got 76,000 caterpillars over a 10-day period. When you walk around, you feed the tree, and the caterpillars come raining down, you pick them up and put them in buckets and you rear them, 500 per bucket. It's a fun. We have a, we have a blast. And that's <laughs> waiting, waiting. Send me an email, and uh, we'll be done with it. And that's waiting for the caterpillar to yeah. fertilize. Well, the, the, pupa, the pupa. The pupa. The pupa. The pupa. And then in mid summer we got them to see how many, which fraction of them has the fly. They have the fly inside of them, and we collect them. Do you do any samples for the fly too, or just just looking at the, the caterpillar? Did you do it for the adult uh, sea albatross? Do you look for those also? Like, do you sample for the for the fly? Yes. You do. We well, we put out the fly. We rear the fly through the winter. Right, but do you like do you do anything to look to see how it spread at all? Well, I, think I showed that thing well, that we just we spread over you know, twenty kilometers in six different directions. You collect the caterpillar. That's how you find the fly. Yeah, right. But do you do anything to collect the cat, the fly itself, like to see where it's going? Oh, where the fly the itself? Fly. You yeah. fly. I get your question. Yeah. No, and well, that would be, I mean, well, the yeah. challenge at the bid to get all this work done. Sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, just kind of, no. what we want to know is what fraction of the caterpillar are the parasite. That's right. the key the data that we're collecting. You can't tell that from collecting the fly, and of course. You know, the fly is probably one of several thousand species of tachinid flies that we didn't have to identify it. So, okay. forget it.